Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a great day and enjoying the last days of 2017. Welcome to our two-part performance webinar series tonight. I'm Joe Staub, trying to do my best Varn impression, beard and all. You know, hope I look good. Hope I uh, keep up what Varn's doing. Like always, if you have any questions, please send them in at any time. We'll be taking a few minutes at the end to do Q&A, but as uh, Matt's going through his talk, if there's anything that comes up, don't be shy, ask. Also want to take a moment and mention anyone in the tactical space who's listening, um, you know, military service members, police, firefighters, EMS, uh, if you use UCAN or want to use UCAN, please contact me directly to order, joe.stob at ucanco.com or on Instagram at ucan underscore joe. So without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for part one tonight, Matt Powell. Matt and I have known each other for 10 years, first meeting when we were students at UConn under Dr. Kramer, uh, with Dr. Kramer, Dr. Volk, and the rest of the exercise science group there at the time. Matt had just come from a football career at Temple to do his master's work, and I was a green behind the ears coaching wannabe, and I was fortunate enough for Matt to take the time and be willing to help develop me as a coach on my journey as he was on his. Matt left UConn and went on to work at all levels in the strength and conditioning world, having stops at multiple colleges from assistant to head strength and conditioning coach, as well as having a couple stops in the NFL. In the random fact category for the evening, he actually helped train my wife while she was a high jumper at UConn, and he even worked with guest number two tonight, Carwin Sharp, when they overlapped at the College of Charleston. Matt currently works with the 3rd Ranger Battalion of the 75th Ranger Regiment, optimized training for those soldiers, helping extend careers, preparing for combat, as well as helping rehab anyone who was injured on or off the battlefield. Matt holds multiple certifications related to training and performance, and is currently completing coursework to sit for the registered dietitian exam. He also walks the walk, competed in powerlifting and strongman when he's not coaching. All right, Paul, how was that? Was that a pretty good introduction? Man, that was perfect. The only thing you didn't mention was how good a track you were. That's the only thing I was waiting to hear, is how amazing you were. Ah, uh, you know, well, I, did, I couldn't hype myself up too much when I'm trying to help you up. I know it's hard to hype you up. So, you know, I, I tried to have to bolster it a little bit. No, I appreciate that for sure. No, you hit it right on the head, man. It was perfect. And 10 years makes me feel really old, by the way. I know. I can't out. believe I can't believe it's been 10 years. So obviously, you know, thank you for participating and helping. Um, so, you know, find it kind of first, just kind of the easy one. Um, you know, fill in any gaps, fill in anything I missed, and talk about how you ended up working in the tactical space. Yeah, I got super lucky. I was the head strength coach at Southeast Louisiana University that you had mentioned. I still uh, keep in contact with a lot of those great athletes down there. Great place to live. Um, <clears throat> and then what happened was we had a uh, coaching change and one of my former strength coaches I had at Temple actually called me and asked me if I want to do a job in tactical. I said, yes, it was a chance for my wife to get closer to home in Georgia and then a chance for me to work for a you know great organization with third Ranger bat. And I just couldn't turn it down, man. I got super lucky. You know, I get asked all the time, how do I get a job in tactical strength and conditioning? Uh, <laughs> I just got super lucky. So I definitely appreciate that. And, uh, just continue to grow in the field as I go and just trying to learn more about it every day. Nice, nice. Well, knowing you and knowing how good of a coach you are, I'd imagine it's not just luck. You're obviously prepared to do the job. So, you know, right time, right place. But, you know, I personally know you could you can do the job. So, you know, I don't yeah, think I it was just that. luck. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just, you know, I'll swing for the fence. <laughs> <laughs> so in order to make sure everyone's on the same page, um, do you mind quickly kind of describing the differences? You know, there's a lot in the, the world right now in society with special forces and special operations and Green Berets and Navy SEALs. So would you mind just kind of describing the differences uh, specifically with what population you work with so people are in the right mindset? And then also any uh, misconceptions, you know, big picture stuff as it relates to training so that way we kind of all can start on equal footing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something I'm going to get to in my PowerPoints later on. But, <clears throat> excuse me, with the uh, different special operations versus special forces, tier one versus tier two, there's so many different components that people don't even realize are a part of it. With uh, my guys are kind of the, the hammer that comes down. They do raids, they go in, they take over compounds, airfields, things like that. And they're definitely the violent, good after kind of guys, as opposed to special forces, which is more of the go in there and, you know, oppress the, uh, or liberate the oppressed and go through and actually teach them, work with the guys who are actually in the country, work with the people there, help build schools, things like that. Um, so the Rangers definitely have a, a good, 
mix of everything. We still go through and we still do some of those missions, but for the most part, it is a point raid, go in and just take over complexes, take over compounds and take over airfields. That's the biggest thing they do. And that's kind of what their mission statement has really turned into, especially as it's gone from GWAT, obviously starting in Iraq and then moving on to Afghanistan and now moving potentially into other parts of the world with the way things are moving right now politically. Mm -hmm. um, so now that you kind of gave an idea of the mission set, so what does it look like from a broad sense, from an actual training, from you know a strength and conditioning standpoint? Yeah, and as you mentioned earlier, there are definitely misconceptions out there. So everybody thinks that these guys always do CrossFit. They always do, you know, metabolic conditioning. And that's the only thing they really focus on. They don't really look at it, the fact that I get a lot of 18 to 23-year-old kids. That's the normal range of kids that I get. <clears throat> and you really have to develop them as a complete athlete, not just their, you know, ability to go through 100 burpees or 100 of whatever, like you see in a CrossFit style workout, but more of the, I have to develop their power, I have to develop their strength, I have to develop their ability to be agile and fast, and also work in their heart rate zones to make sure they can accomplish different endurance based things they need to for their job it's not just jump out of the bird like you see in the movies and all of a sudden you're shooting and then gunfight that's not how it works a lot of times a lot of times there's an infill where you actually go into the compound or go into the location you are going through mountains in afghanistan or going through the more urban settings like iraq <laughs> and then they have to take on whatever their mission is and then get back in that exfil which again could be 5 10 15k and they don't know what the distance is going to be so it's not just important for them to be metabolically fit they also have to have great heart rate zones great recovery you know obviously be healthy you can't help the club in the tub is the classic built for ourselves quote if you're hurt you're not helping anybody and just being able to teach them from the very beginning about power about strength about agility and how it applies to their job and why it's so important and that's something that has really become a teaching component when there's only two strength coaches for a thousand guys it comes down to what can i teach a large number of people how can I teach leadership to teach the guys underneath them and then them to teach underneath as well? So it's just kind of trickling down from the top. If we can teach that and slowly work and change a you know entire philosophy and an entire way people train, then all of a sudden our organization does better. And compared to five years ago, I know they train a lot less bench press and bicep curls and a whole lot more power, speed, strength, agility, and actually still being in very good endurance shape as well so they can complete any mission dependent upon – where it goes and what they have to do. Mm -hmm. So I think it kind of goes without saying that obviously, as you mentioned, the evolution of their training, you know, has kind of helped not only the career longevity, but the effectiveness. And, you know, we both have a, a very mutual uh, and good friend who's actually coming to visit me tomorrow, um, who I've worked with throughout his career in special forces. And you've also done some work with. Um, so would you mind just kind of mentioning just a real quick, or are you going to go into it in the PowerPoint? If you are, then we'll skip over it. You know, the evolution of kind of where training for these guys was and then kind of where it is now. Yeah, so that's a great question. <clears throat> when they started the Thor 3 program eight, 10 years ago, the guy that I worked with also has been there eight years. I've been there almost six now. And it was amazing just what the facilities looked like. And, and people don't think about that. You know, you just assume that these are tier one soldiers they're going to have the best facilities they're going to have everything they need that's not what we walked into we walked into a basement with black widows water coming down from pipes to bone heads broken glass everywhere and every single piece of bodybuilding equipment that you could possibly think of if you're doing anything explosive or violent you were looked at like what the hell are you doing go pick up something heavy and just lift it nice slow controlled you know all the sets were six to ten to twelve reps very bodybuilding us very you know, if you read the Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding by Arnold, you were pretty much the guy. Like, you knew what to do. And then you would go run, do push-ups, do sit-ups, and you were considered the fittest guy there. So coming in, and as I kind of touched on earlier, that whole change of philosophy and under, making them understand this isn't your job. This isn't going to help you in a battle situation or in any situation that requires you to be good at your job. We need to make sure and go through and change this. It was definitely a battle about that. So we had the guys who loved the lifts, and we had the guys who loved to run. And the idea was to find that middle ground where you can lift and still run or run and then still be very good at lifting and find that nice mix where if the 250 pound guy <clears throat> plus you had 100 pounds on the kit, weapon, Mitch, et cetera, has on his you know, body and you need to carry him away from a dangerous situation, can you do it? And the question is usually answered no by a lot of those runners at that point. And we've really worked to kind of change that. But like I said, it broke down into two group categories. You're either a lifter and your squad or platoon size element who did PT together always lifted, or you were a running platoon slash squad and all you did was run. And then on your own time as a private and so forth, you would just go and do whatever you enjoy. But 
you know, time is limited. You're tired. You're getting smoked all the time. You're going on deployments. You've got training. It's just not happening all that much as well. So your training really suffers because you're only getting one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So in addition, you would say that the evolution of a more structured, formalized, and specific training program also lended itself to that kind of work in nutrition, in psychology, in, you know, all the other elements that relate to performance, correct? Absolutely. And looking at it from the outside coming in, you know, coming in from college and coming in from the NFL, to me, it was, it was you know, just common sense. You walk in, you know exactly what you want to do with the strength coach. You know that you're going to have athletic trainers, physical therapists, you know, whatever else you need. And then you're going to have a nutritionist or dietitian. You're going to have every single thing and piece that you need, a mental performance coach, a mental enhancement coach. And you're going to be able to do these different things. And it just, I, I thought this is what it would be. And I, when I walked in, it was definitely not. It's coming in an amazing way. The staff is definitely beefed up. Now we have regiment wide, you know, dietitians, mental, inform, mental performance coach, excuse me. Uh, strength coaches at every battalion and it's definitely gotten a lot better but all those things have slowly developed like people don't realize how new relatively speaking all this is you know they had strength coaches back in the 19 freaking 40s and 50s and 60s they didn't be called strength coaches, but they were the coach who wanted the gym and worked with them and then you get the guys like boyd epley who've been around mm -hmm. what, 40, 50 years who've been officially doing it with a title you know um and you would just expect these guys to be a little further along but even just the way they view training was, you know, I'm not a uh, strength athlete. I'm not a football player. I don't need to do cleans or squats or presses or pulls. All I need to do is some bicep curls, some bench press, go run, do my push-ups, do my PT improvement, and I'm done. And it's really taken a long time to kind of get the buy-in and get the guys to really believe in what they're doing and kind of grow the system and grow the whole program, really. Cool. So at this point, I'm going to kind of step back and let you uh, pop up your PowerPoint and have you take the reins. Um, and, you know, it's your show, Matt. No, I appreciate it. All right. Hopefully I don't screw up the IT side of this because I'm just a strength coach. Remember that. No, that's the first time I did one of these with Bar, and I did too. I didn't want to touch the wrong buttons or anything and mess with stuff. So <laughs> I, I know that feeling. For all you guys yeah. watching – for all you guys watching, we have advanced degrees in exercise science, exercise phys. We can train kids to adults to geriatrics. IT, not our thing. <laughs> you ready to roll? Not at all. Can you see the PowerPoint? I can. Perfect. Just wanted to make sure. All right. So basically what I did was I went through and, and kind of made this very simple PowerPoint. I was hoping we get some good conversation out of it. Um, there we go. So this breaks down kind of what we were talking about earlier about what a ranger does, what we expect from our ranger <clears throat> and who he is. So many times people don't really know anything about the special operations community besides Navy SEAL because that's the, you know, the hot name right now. And that's the guys coming out with the movies and the books and the CEOs are all seen to be Navy SEALs, et cetera, now. So this is just a quick rundown of what they do. But it goes back to how you can, can help them when you look at things like, all right, they need to be able to carry 150 pounds plus of gear at any moment through the mountains of Afghanistan or any other location where you can find them. And they need to be able to actually go for unknown distances, be able to sprint throughout that different time, depending upon what's happening on the mission, be able to do the different power things like jumping, sprinting, climbing, all the things that really take it to actually make it to the next mission and get to where you need to go in order to take care of what you came there to take care of. Um, so this kind of breaks down exactly what they need to be doing and exactly what their job entails. Um, so, the normal things are in there that we talked about, the ability to do body weight training. The PT improvement's important. It's how you keep your job. You need to be able to hit that certain number of push-ups, certain number of sit-ups, certain number of pull-ups, run your two-mile or five-mile, depending upon what unit you're in, and still be able to handle those. But if that's all you can do, are you actually going to be good at your job? And it's an argument I have all the time with older guys who've been in the organization a long time about, <clears throat> you know, do we need all this specialized training? Do we need all of this? You know, Rangers back in World War II, Point Du Hawk went up and, you know, they took care of things and, and came away with the huge W that changed the war. Like, why are we any different than them? But I think what's changed is obviously the technology has changed. They weren't carrying as much heavy stuff. Um, the mission set has changed. You're not doing the same kind of missions that they were back then. And honestly, the ability to last in that position and last in that organization has gotten better because we have strength coaches, physical therapists, dietitians, et cetera, and actually able to kind of protect an investment because that's what these guys are by the time they go through you know ranger assessment selection process or rasp and actually go through everything and airborne school and, and basic and everything else they're worth about a million dollars or more they are a professional athlete at that point 
That's what the government has put into them. So our job is to try to keep them as long as possible, keep them healthy, and keep them doing their mission at the highest level possible to ensure victory and also to ensure their quality of life as well, because obviously we care about them as people and, and human beings and individuals. Cool. So a couple questions rolling in. Actually, one's a tech question. Um, you're still on the title slide, right? Because the view for us, um, you haven't advanced a slide yet, correct? <laughs> I, I thought I did. Apparently, I haven't. Actually, I think, you know what? I think you might have to put us on slideshow. Gotcha. My Sue problem. and Steven, Sue and Steven, I gotcha. I gotcha. We're here. We're trying. Thank you for your questions. Like I said, we are not super tech people. So any any troubleshooting issues that come up, please help us. And then while we're trying to figure this out, we got a question uh, from another Steven. Matt, who's cooler, Navy SEALs or Rangers? Oh, there's absolutely no question about it. It's the uh, Navy SEALs. I mean, there's they have more movies. They have more uh, books. They have more everything. Steven, that is a great question. And I don't know who you are, but you're doing a great job. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> I'm getting told right now they can see slide three. Um, would you mind just yep. popping back to slide two real quick? Absolutely. How about that? People see that okay? They cannot. I don't know why it's doing that, Joe. Any uh, recommendations here? Uh, do you want to possibly, let's see, maybe, um, do you want to close out the PowerPoint and try and restart it and see if we can get it back up in, uh, I think, yeah. ooh, that oh, might have done it. We go. Yeah, I don't know what that was, but it worked. So, All right, this is the, the uh, slide I was <laughs> Someone in the crowd, let us know that we're doing it. We're, we're on the right track here. Someone in the crowd, please. <laughs> All right, perfect. Just got one. Just got a message from over here, a real local one. All right, I got a, I got a Kelly and I got a Sue saying we look good. I know we do. I know the. Oh, you mean the slides? We're good. <laughs> so the slide on the screen right now, which everyone should see, uh, says a ranger is a member. Is the first couple words, and that is slide two. That is slide two. We are there. I think we are. Right. Again, I'm stepping back. I'm trying not to break anything. Matt, your show. Oh, you're good, brother. So that was everything I just kind of went over. It kind of just breaks down the different components of the training and why it's so important to do all the different variations of, you know, power, strength, <laughs> aerobic, anaerobic, <clears throat> excuse me, every single part of it at the same time and still be able to improve all those different facets of training. So, <clears throat> Joe, any questions on that one? Feeling good? We're ready to go to slide three since it's, you know, been on here for a whole 30 seconds now? No, hey, I think we're good. I think we're good. All right, perfect. Are we good on, on slide three? All right. So looking now at the uh, daily schedule, this is kind of what we try to get we're our guys stuck, to go through the entire – Stuck on slide two. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for being patient with us. Obviously, we're trying – I got it. We're good. Nope. Yep. Woo! Uh -huh. All right, but that was a quick one. That was an easy one. All right, so this is the uh, daily schedule of kind of what we try to take our guys through. Obviously, we start every day with some sort of warm-up, myofascial release, dynamic warm-up, mobilize, one or two areas of greatest restriction. Guys will come in depending upon what they've done the day before, obviously from training, but also from their job. If they were walking around in boots, uh, if they were walking around in a kit, if they were walking around in all sorts of stuff that they typically wear on the job, they're going to come in with issues. Two of the biggest things that we run into, one, Feet, ankles, calves tend to get very tight. Boots are not made for running the long distances they often do, no matter how good the technology has become. Guys will get a little bound up. Plus, when they're not working out and doing other things in the field, they're often stuck at their desks. So that will run into more calf tightness, foot tightness, and all sorts of issues you run to at the bottom of the feet, not to mention calluses, blisters, things like that. So we try to really take care of that. We try to take care of lumbar and thoracic as well. Wearing a kit – you know, 60 to 80 pounds, depending upon what level you're at and also what you're carrying is going to cause a big issue there. So thoracic and lumbar mobility is another huge area of what we're trying to fix and get after. <clears throat> Nine times out of 10, we'll have them do core first just because we know they're going to get pulled away based on their job. So we have to get that in as soon as possible just to kind of create as much balance as we possibly can. A lot of these guys we see come in stuck in flexion from having to carry heavy things like rucks, kits, et cetera, all the time. So we try to take care of that, especially with stabilization and any sort of moving stabilization as well. So that's why the carries are on there as well. Um, our explosive movements are really 
Sorry, go ahead. No, nice. Uh, it's going to say, obviously, it's like you said, it's kind of something you have to do because of the nature of their job. So, you know, while some people out there with a training background may say, hey, you need to do your explosive work first, you know, it's kind of one of those situational changes you have to make because of who you're working with. You know, context always matters. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And that was something I kind of talked about as well with other people when I first came here. And I was like, hey, why aren't we doing, you know, the explosive stuff first as well? Right after the dynamic dynamic warm up, because it's kind of what gets beaten into your head over the years, especially when you're a Kramer graduate, like I know we both are. You get told that's the most important thing you need to knock it out first. It's the highest level. It's the highest closeness. But if we didn't do the core or carry immediately, I'll tell you what, not 90% of the time or more, we would not be able to get that in just due to a lack of time, constraints, what the guys have going on, et cetera. <clears throat> Our uh, explosive movements have changed drastically over the years. We were lucky if we had guys who would throw a medicine ball or do a jump. And now we're lucky enough to have a lot of guys who are actually very, very technically sound within the Olympic movements just because of years of beating it into their heads. <clears throat> and unlike the college setting where it's very hard, it's very, you know, difficult to coach that many guys, we have these guys who come in and really want to learn the movement and actually get after it. So the technical side is not as difficult as some of the other settings that I've worked in. They really get after it. And the ones who truly want to learn often go on to compete in Olympics lifting, powerlifting, or strongman, depending upon what they like about it. <clears throat> the leg yeah, about Question from the crowd. Question from Nathan. What are your preferred carries for the beginning of the workout? That, that is a great question. Uh, we've been getting more and more equipment as we go. Um, we'll do a lot of single arm sing, or unilateral carries. So we'll do a lot of single arm front rate or single arm front rack, excuse me, kettlebell carries. We'll do suitcase carries. We'll do waiters carries. We'll do anything where we can unilaterally or offset load them just to make sure we're really getting as much as we possibly can out of that load. And then we want to go a little heavier depending upon the day and obviously what we have planned for that training and where they're at in the uh, training cycle. We can go a little heavier with farmers carries, yoke carries, Conan carries. <clears throat> we'll do a lot of different variations. We just got a lot of sandbags in. Uh, we got a couple of those worms from Rogue. So the guys will go out and do that. So squat or platoon size element. Uh, it really just depends. We have kegs now as well. So we, we really mix it up and uh, we try to do a lot of different things. But like I said, my favorite ones, especially that early in the workout, is we'll probably do a lot of offset or unilateral loading. So like I said, single kettlebell front rack carry or a suitcase carry or a waiter's carry, probably three of my favorites that I would definitely do a lot of. Cool, 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 cool. Um, the leg has changed drastically too. When we first got into that room downstairs, it was a leg press, a leg extension, a leg curl, <clears throat> and there was one deadlift platform and then two or three really crappy squat racks. So that's come a long way as well. Um, we now have a lot, most of our guys either squat, pitch shark squat, safety squat bar squat, or any variation, box squat, pause squat, et cetera, that does not hurt them depending upon, you know, previous training injuries and where they're at in their career. Uh, so that's come a long way. We do as many single leg variations as we possibly can. Again, going back to that same issue about being able to load them safely. And knowing their job that we don't need to squat them at 500 pounds, but then we have some freaks who can squat over 500 pounds and still run a very impressive five mile of, you know, 35 or less minutes and get after it. So it's a, it's a nice mix of guys in different styles of lifting and who wants to train certain ways to help themselves for sure. Posterior chain, the other argument I have, and that's kind of why core and posterior chain are both highlighted in that reddish color. <clears throat> we uh, had a very hard time initially getting – that to be an important part of their workouts. You know, glue hams, reverse hypers, uh, glue bridges, glue or any sort of extension through the hip was very difficult to get just because the guys didn't think it was important. You know, it's one of those muscles you don't see very often. They thought that it would make them bad runners. And it's just something we've had to argue over and over again. But over the last three or four years, it's really come a long way as far as understanding the importance, understanding how much it can help with low back pain, which is another huge issue you run into, especially from the overuse injuries that these guys typically get. And uh, it's definitely proven worthwhile just because of, you know, fewer and fewer injuries and fewer and fewer guys with ACL, specifically non-contact ACL. So it's definitely been going in the right direction. Uh, press, pull, posterior shoulder. We're big on making sure our posterior shoulder is strong as well. Obviously, pushing and pulling, always great. But you need to find that nice balance of two-to-one or one-to-one, -one, whatever your coaching style leads to. But we are huge on the pull-aparts, face pulls. Anything we can do for prehabilitation, these guys <clears throat> are always carrying stuff on their shoulder or with their shoulders, meaning they always have something carried overhead, across the shoulder, you know, kits, rucks, et cetera, always putting pressure down on them. But making sure we have that posterior shoulder strong, also to protect from all the push-ups and high volume they're doing is of extreme importance to us as well. Yep. You know, most people don't realize that they never carried a heavy kit like that. 
picture of the heaviest backpack you ever carried when you were in elementary and grade school, put one on your back, put one on your front. So you have one on each side and then probably add another 30 or 40 pounds and walk around with it for a couple hours. That's the kind of feeling. It's a little different than what most people even understand it to be. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have to factor in the fact that a lot of times shoulders start going numb, traps start getting very sore, a whole bunch of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, moving on to the next slide. Hopefully this one goes smooth. Victory, baby. Woo! Hey, I'll take it right there. So <clears throat> one of the questions I was thinking about as I was getting ready for this, you know, fantastic opportunity to talk to a stub like yourself, I thinking about when our guys utilize you, you can the most. And when I first reached out to a couple of the guys from you can, you know, back when I first got my job here, before you become a part of this organization, Joe, <clears throat> he asked me, he said, um, you know, do you think the guys would use it? And I said, I, I believe so. And he told me about how some of the guys, the most elite tier unit the army has uses it quite a bit, especially the cadre. So as they're walking through with the candidates through their selection, typically a lot of those guys will use it. It's a very ruck intensive and very high, endurance based selection so i started to spread it around to some of the guys who had decided they wanted to go that route for the career and they saw great results <clears throat> and then i thought about other times where they could use it as well and uh, that's kind of what prompted these next few slides so these are the most commonly tested endurance based pt that we do these are the numbers that you have to get remember these are the bare minimum i'm talking about if you hit these numbers you are <clears throat> the least physically fit ranger probably in your squad or platoon so these are not something to strive for, but these are the base numbers you have to hit in order just to stay in the organization. Otherwise, you lose your job and you're kicked out to a big army unit somewhere else as an infantryman. So <clears throat> these are the numbers that absolutely need to be maintained at all times. But things like a 12-mile ruck at 15 minutes or better miles with that weight or a lot of times heavier because of the way it turns out with water, other loading, clothes, et cetera, you're going to be looking at, you know, three hours ish to get that done <clears throat> or two and a half hours, somewhere in that range. So in order to take care of that, you need to make sure you have a fuel that can run with you. So that's where that superstars would definitely be important. And then getting them to do stuff more like the five mile run where they're going at a pretty good pace. I mean, that's eight minute pace the entire time. And the Ranger physical assessment test is a, a mix of rope climb, sked co drag, um, some two mile run, a one mile run, a couple other events like a caving ladder you have to get through in 40 minutes or less so having the ability to get through that also would be a good time to use it so the Any ranger about those tests? yep so um the ranger physical assessment test for people who don't know it's kind of like an obstacle course race in a sense right correct me if i'm wrong it, there's <laughs> there's more you know just kind of go into that just so people really have an idea of what it is yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, it is similar to what you would think of as an obstacle course. You run two miles as fast as you possibly can. You come back, you complete a battery of tests, including, like I said, the skateco drag, a 300-yard sprint, a rope climb, a caving ladder, and jumping an eight-foot wall. And then you go sprint one more mile as fast as you can, all while wearing boots, you know, your regular <clears throat> pants, and then your kit and your mitch. So all of this is under load as well, which just obviously makes it more difficult for the battery of tests that you're completing during the middle of it. So kind of like a terrible um, obstacle course. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. <laughs> I'm just thinking, because obviously we have people in the audience who, you know, are obstacle course racers, um, you know, Tough Mudder, Spartan race kind of stuff. So there are people from a nutrition strategy standpoint, which I know you're going to get into, who can kind of take the things you're talking about. And even though it's not the same, still apply a lot of the concepts. Yeah, absolutely. And we've had good results of guys taking it even for shorter duration, things like that, being able to do the repeat sprint bouts, which I know is something that UCAN is going to get into more and more with the research, has been very beneficial along with beta alanine and some of the other supplements that guys have been recommended to take by our dietitians. And they've done a great job of setting them up for that pre-workout and peri-workout nutrition to make sure they can take care of it. This is just another example of being prepared when you know you have that event or might have that event coming up. So a lot of times it comes down to a standards week where each company or each battalion or, you know, whatever size element you want to use will actually go through and complete these three things plus a regular fitness test where you're doing push-ups, sit-ups, and pull-ups all within one week or even three days of each other where you are having to knock it all out. <clears throat> and that would be a great time to utilize the Superstarch and the UCAN product in order to actually make sure you are recovered and also have the energy necessary to take care of it. Cool. All right, moving on. 
All right, mission potential. This is something we talk about a lot too. What are you guys going to eat, take in, et cetera, use for supplementation before when, before the mission, when, especially when they know about one to two days out in advance most times so they know about what's coming. And then obviously weather can push right or push left, loom, et cetera, can all play a factor as far as how much light is coming off the moon. <clears throat> um, so this one will change depending upon what the mission set is. It might be a very quick and short infill. It might be a very long one. Sometimes you don't know. And, of course, in its usual way, things don't always go the right way sometimes. So being able to, you know, get in or get out at a certain distance is important. And making sure that you fueled your body the right way is also important. And this is something the dietitian does a great job of talking to the guys about is bringing with them things that they know are going to be good for them in order to complete the mission at the highest level possible. Uh, the food over there is hit or miss. Some places are absolutely amazing, and I'm jealous of what the guys send me or tell me about when they get back. And then some of the places are terrible. You know, they're lucky to see a vegetable for the four months or more that they're over there. And <laughs> it is just really hit and miss. So being able to bring something with you and actually know that, hey, I'm going to have enough energy, I'm going to have enough go to be able to do this is very important to them. And that's why they try to find out whatever works best for them. Um, some of the biggest issues we had when we first got here were a lot of the guys would just crank a couple of rippets and other energy drinks, some, you know, Copenhagen, and then freaking just go get it and do their job. I'm not saying that can't work occasionally, but it wouldn't be my preferred method of how I would tell the guy to do it for sure. Um, especially when you don't know how long it's going to take to get to certain points and how long it's going to take you to do certain things. So the best recommendation I always make is as you're starting to get into about the hour to 45 minutes before you go into the mission, perfect time to fill up and take in one pouch or one packet and then also have one with you just in case things go wrong already in your canteen or whatever water device you have, Camelback, et cetera, ready to go. So you're ready to take it on there as you do your mission. Cool. Moving on. <clears throat> so – while they're back in the States doing training, actually spending time with their family, et cetera, a lot of our guys compete in endurance event-based stuff. They like to do Spartan races, as those people you were talking about who may be asking questions. They like to do a lot of bike races, specifically road. We do have a few guys who do mountain bike racing. Uh, we have a lot of guys who do triathlons, half and full marathons, and half and full Ironman. We even had a few guys do those. The Ironman guys are a little bit more rare, but the marathons, triathlons, and bike races are all very common. And then, you know, a little bit shorter, probably don't need as much, but still important to think about are the 5Ks, 10Ks. And then, of course, paying tribute to the guys in uh, Mogadishu Mile and make sure you go out there and support everybody, also important. Um, <clears throat> this is when the guys probably will get the most bang for their buck out of their supplementation and their endurance use is when they're training up for the next appointment and trying to get in workouts while they're home. Uh, the lucky ones are, are lucky enough to have a wife who likes to do a similar hobby or sport with them and go out and ride with them or do the triathlon with them or even the marathon. And they will actually compete with them and they're able to, you know, spend time with the family and also train at the same time. And it works out perfectly. Some of the other guys just have to kind of do a little bit of time management and that makes it even more difficult and also makes it more difficult to obviously take care of the nutrition side because you have to be faster about it and take care of it. Just another great opportunity to use a you know, solid product that will help you in your long term endurance. But this is when a lot of our guys use it as well. Cool. <clears throat> another good time is when. Uh, <laughs> You know, you get the classic smoke session of a platoon sergeant squad later, et cetera, taking their guys out and actually doing tactically focused PT. This can be anything from putting on boots and a kit and going through multiple obstacle courses all over um, the post. This can be going to our training facility where we have this thing called a Punisher with a, you know, 30 yard ramp, stairs of differing heights, ropes, cargo nets, monkey bar systems, et cetera, and just smoking them on that all within a small area. And then, one of my favorite stories of all times, right before I got there, a platoon did a really poor job on their training event. They, I think it was TFT or NFTX, a uh, field training exercise or a tactical field training uh, event. So they're out there and the guys did a poor job. And the platoon sergeant came back and said, everybody be here on Monday at whatever time. And the guys actually ran a marathon that next time because the platoon sergeant was so ticked off about how they performed. But every single guy finished the marathon. I, and I'm not saying the times are great. I'm not saying this is what I would recommend again. But just putting in, in place how mentally tough some of these guys are and that they will never quit no matter what challenge or event you throw at them. They will always complete the mission, you know, and they will always follow through and they will always finish everything that they are supposed to finish. And that's, you know, one of the best parts about working with them. But it's also one of the more challenging parts about working with them is figuring out, you know, that balance of volume and intensity and making sure these guys aren't just beating themselves to the ground all the time and figuring out how to make it work the best way possible for them. 
No, I have a, uh, I have a similar funny story about that. I was uh, training a tactical operator and part of, he was preparing for a selection course and I was doing it remotely through the internet, sending him, you know, his emails and training programs. And, you know, part of what he had to do was a long mid distance run. So in process of going to it, you know, we had a mile uh, interval workout and I said, you know, Hey, you have to run a mile as just fast as you can. Um, and then, you know, you take one minute rest and you run a mile as fast as you can. So he was supposed to get back to me. I didn't hear from him for like a week. And I get an email and was like, Hey Joe, you know, I'm finally medically cleared to, you know, be physically active again. And I was like, what happened? You know? And he goes, well, he goes, I passed out at the track. He said, you know, you told me to run a mile as fast as I could take a minute and run another one. He's like, so I ran until I almost blacked out, tried to wait 60 seconds and then ran as fast as I could. And then I blacked out and then they found me and they made me do a bunch of tests before they would let me train again. And I, you know, I had to remember, you know, that's how these guys are. You know, it's a different kind of training when you're willing to go that far. Absolutely. There's no question about it. The <clears throat> amount of heat injuries are, you know, absolutely unreal. Obviously down here in Georgia, it's quite warm, plus the humidity. And these guys, you know, <clears throat> when you're 18 to 22 years old, you have other important things to take care of on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. It may not involve as much hydration with actually hydrating drinks as possible. And, you know, a dip of Copenhagen every hour, et cetera, doesn't help as well with hydration. So it's definitely a matter of <laughs> educating them again and making sure they understand that, Hey, you need to recover in order to come back and hit that awesome workout that you were really wanting to get after for sure. Cool. So the next one that comes up, and this is probably where the guys, I mean, the guys get a lot when they're doing their, you know, bike races, et cetera. And we have some guys who are very good endurance athletes. We even have some guys who go pro and triathletes, pro triathletes, excuse me, and pro marathon runners. Um, but this is, this is the bang for the buck. This is when guys <clears throat> really start to get focused on their nutrition, their supplementation, and making sure they're actually taking care of everything and, and getting after it with UCAN specifically. Um, so most of the selections throughout the entire JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command, are highly endurance-based. And you're going to have a ruck on your back, and you can expect to have just about every single day that you're there. And you can expect to be moving long, long distances through the entire time that you are there. And you are not allowed to quit. You are not allowed to stop. You are not allowed to even slow down. So you need to maintain certain time points in order to continue the course. And we can get into more specifics, but I'd rather not. I'd rather kind of <laughs> leave it out there. There's plenty of stuff on the internet you can find about specific selections and exactly what they get into and exactly how to train for them. But I can tell you this, when our guys start to train up for this, we do definitely start to crank up the low impact cardio. We start to <clears throat> crank up the intensity. And we also start to crank up the amount of time that they spend in their zone one and zone two heart rates. So we are training Which, in that zone. Oh, I'm sorry. No, which leads into actually a question and someone in the audience just asked and a question I wanted to ask at this point. You know, I know we can't get into some of the specifics just because the nature of what it is. But from a training and monitoring standpoint, you know, um, do you use heart rate monitors? Do you use, um, you know, some of the new systems, something like Catapult? You know, what kind of monitoring from a kinematic and kinetic standpoint do you use as well as do you guys do? blood work do you do you know what kind of stuff do you do to track um you know your operators as they you can run through these processes yeah absolutely so the heart rate monitors are extremely useful for us we use those as much as we possibly can we're working on getting one for every single guy in the battalion right now we have them so you can sign them out or guys will go and buy their own depending upon how dedicated they are to the training but we absolutely bring them in we do the metabolic testing we make sure we know exactly where the heart rate zones are <clears throat> and then we explain to them how to utilize those heart rate zones and obviously we program for them as well the blood testing is a great question it's something we've really worked to try to improve over the last few years and our new dietitian has really been great about it and trying to uh, utilize it more as well um, so that's one of the things coming our way very soon here obviously they'll be tested for important inflammation markers as well as general anabolic and other responses that they might be getting you know so we're going to test for test igf1 and also you know extremely important stuff like cortisol and making sure that their lipid levels etc are also in the right places so Having an entire blood panel will be extremely important at this point. And we've had guys who've really gone out of their way to make sure they do that. And they're, ironically, usually the people who end up passing, surprisingly enough. Um, <clears throat> we have had cat catapult before. That was an amazing system. Unfortunately enough, that uh, system was taken to a different unit. So we weren't able to utilize it as much as we wanted. But when we did, we definitely use it, utilize it as much as possible. Um, that's something I also had at a couple other places I was at. I definitely would recommend that system for anybody out there going through the train up just so they can 
track all the GPS, all the heart rate, you know, as much ventilation as possible and really figure out where you need to focus. We have very few guys here who have a good zone one heart rate zone because they, all they do, like we were talking about a second ago with those anecdotal stories about how they just go out and they hammer as hard as they possibly can until they're going to die. And that's what they will continue to do until you train them to do something else because they don't know quit. They don't know how to stop. They don't know anything besides go as hard as I can. Otherwise, I'm either not going to be able to stay here. Or I'm going to get fired. Something bad is going to happen if I don't go as hard as I can. So that goes back to the whole retooling the philosophy and re-educating them on, hey, you need to stay in the zone for 45 to 60 minutes, 90 minutes, depending upon your goal. And we need to do this three, four, five days a week, depending upon how poorly trained you are in that zone. And that becomes a whole other you know, separate education piece that we really need to get after. So right now, unfortunately enough, we are mostly a heart rate monitor only. Uh, we are working to get more blood testing. And like I said, we had Catapult for a while, and we're looking to get a different system in place hopefully soon. Cool. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is a, probably the most fun thing to train guys up for, honestly, just because they are so dedicated. A lot of times they come out of position, meaning they don't have another job to do. So I can really see them for three, four hours a day, do rehabilitation or prehabilitation, do all their training for their endurance, and then also get some sort of power strength. And, you know, I don't want to say hypertrophy, but higher volume, almost metabolic conditioning style lifting, dependent upon what we're doing and what the guy needs to focus on. So this is definitely one of my favorite things to train these guys up for. And honestly, that's one of my favorite things about working with, you know, a thousand guys or close to it is that you get so many different things to work with guys for. You know, it's not always just having the same sport come in in different groups and you do the exact same lift over and over again. You know, there's things to miss about college and NFL, et cetera. And there's also things that are here that are great as well. So it's just a mix of everything. Cool. Yeah. So selection training, that's what I would recommend. Anybody out there who's starting to do that, I would definitely recommend <clears throat> anytime you're doing your long bikes, we'll do a bike into a ruck a lot to get that leg fatigue so the guys aren't underneath the ruck for four, five, six hours. So they're only underneath it for one, maybe two, doing a three to six mile sprint with it as fast as they possibly can, usually on flat ground. And then the other thing that, that really a lot of people forget about as they're going through their selection train up is to change the terrain. You don't know what kind of terrain you're going to be on. It could be absolutely terrible depending upon where you go. And some places it's actually not that bad from what I've been told from some of the guys who've gone to other selections within JSOC. It's just a matter of the mileage. So uh, hopping on a bike, going out for a you know, 20, 25 mile ride, or maybe a little bit less depending upon where your training is, and then putting a ruck on your back and go doing three to six miles as fast as you can is a great way to simulate the fatigue, that lactate threshold, and all the other factors that go into just being tired while having a ruck on your back and having to continue walking as opposed to keeping that axial load at all times while rucking through different terrain and different crap as well. Cool. It's interesting. Yeah. It's just, it, again, it's just a way, again, it's another way to skin the cat. You don't always have to, like you said, just ruck with a ruck, you know, by pre-fatiguing yourself on a bike, swimming, any type of non-weight bearing way to stress yourself and then put a little ruck at the end you can simulate that fatigue without having just the, the total damage from <laughs> rucking itself. Absolutely. And that fellow friend that we have will tell you one of the biggest things that hurt his back or will continue to hurt his back is rucking. That's one or wearing kit. That's when he feels least comfortable in his job. And unfortunately, you know, wearing kit for him was a, a big part of his job and it'll determine whether or not he stays with that unit or not. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and then one of the other things that we do a lot of is uh, on their day off or their, sorry, their, um, weekend day while they're training on the weekend the one day while they're getting ready for selection they'll often do a, a mini triathlon well they'll actually do a bike or sorry swim into a bike into a ruck or a bike and swim into a run depending upon where they're at in their train up but typically we don't like to put a ruck on the guy's back more than once or twice a month it just wreaks havoc on everything they are usually tore up their feet are banged up they're typically rounded forward their flexion is terrible we need to go back and do a ton of mobility their hips get ate up so we really try to find that balance of enough to make sure they understand the suck and know how to push through, but also make sure that they recover enough and their heart rate zones are in the right place and the recovery is in the right place and everything else is on point. So we don't have to have them under a ruck as much. And especially with the older guys, we try to save them as much beating as possible and make sure they really get taken care of and go up there because they know the suck. They've been on all the missions. They've taken care of ranger school and all the other schools that come along with being in this job. And they know how to push through when things you know are not fun and they need to go harder, but making sure that they're not as beat up going in and they can peak within the first seven to 10 days there when the selection gets really hard is more important to me than making sure we keep a ruck on them for 
four, five, six hours at a time. Yep. No, it's just just like anything where you're trying to train, you got to be ready when you're supposed to be ready. Not, you know, too many people are practice heroes, and when the competition comes, they're they're nowhere to be seen. So, you know, obviously it's a different setting preparing for combat, but you know, same thing. You know, you can do the best possible thing when there's no pressure, but when there's pressure, you know, you need to be ready to roll. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you. I know we still got a few more minutes, but I'll just roll through the slideshow since it's been uh, <laughs> such an adventure trying to get to work. I just want to say thanks to all the boys, uh, you know, who've been there before and also are still there now. Uh, it's been a great job and I love it. And uh, they're all awesome. And they really taught me a lot about myself and, and how to be a better coach. Uh, I want to thank my wife and daughter. You know, they're the two really pretty ones in there and that ugly guy is someone else. Um, but, you know, they're really awesome. And every day I come home is a good day. And, um, you know, I just love them and I appreciate all the support. And then um, I just really want to say, you know, just make sure that people know this is an honor of these guys. They're the ones who've uh, made the ultimate sacrifice recently since I've been here. And, you know, I just want to make sure to give them a little shout out, a little honor. Awesome. Um, obviously, like you said, we have a couple seconds left. So we'll do a little Q&A. We have a couple questions hanging around in the space from when people asked. Um, you know, we have a couple people obviously giving their support for, uh, you know, your guys and what they do for us. And obviously, you know, we've talked about it before. We have a, uh, you know, a, a very higher level of respect for the people who allow us to do this kind of stuff. You know, we wouldn't be sitting here having this webinar if it wasn't for the people, uh, you know, you train and the other people like them out there, you know, allowing us to do this stuff every day in our country. So, you know, a lot of support to them. Um, so, Matt, a couple quick little things supplement wise yeah got you back supplement wise uh you would mention some other supplementation that um you know guys are using uh steve olson had a great question about uh, any use of fermented beets or anything like that so kind of if you want to take a second and talk about supplements and any specific things or combinations of things uh, in addition to the you can yeah absolutely and that's a great question from steve um <clears throat> so beet juice has definitely been shown to have some positive antioxidant effects as well as some endurance effects as well. It's becoming more and more popular. Some of the, you know, anecdotal issues or actual use issues, um, guys running into staining, guys running into spilling it, having issues with it that way. It's also very hard to have in a canteen as opposed to being able to put, you know, a simple packet or a gel or a gummy or whatever bar option you have. You got to remember as they're rucking during selection, if they're going to do something parry workout, they need to be able to get their hands on it, rip it with a pair of gloves on it, and then throw it down as fast as possible. Or grab the water, grab the camel back, throw a little bit in there, shake it up, and then send it. And it's got to be ease of use. Almost like when the way you plan somebody while they're doing a triathlon or a long bike ride, they need to know how to ride, pull the bottle off, take the swig, put it back on without falling, unclipping, any of the embarrassing stuff that could happen. So it's got a lot of research to it. It could very potentially be a good product. The actual use of it might not be as uh, simple as some of the other things out there that are providing just as good of a quality product. Cool. Cool, cool. We have uh, a very important question I have to make sure I address. Um, Chelsea Powell asked us, how did you get such a beautiful wife? Man, um, so funny story. Similar to how, first of all, hold on, let's go back real quick. How, how did you get your wife? Didn't you just follow her around the track team over and over and over again until she finally said yes? I know she's sitting there back there somewhere. I, think I, I, I did. Happened. She, um you know, again, I think we both outkicked our coverage uh, a little far beyond what we were should have. Um, and I will just defer and say that much like you, I come home every day um, to the best possible person I ever could. Um, and now it's your turn. So thank you for trying to flip it. But I'm going to put it back on you. In doubt, you deflect. Always deflect. Uh, no. So there's a pretty graduate assistant. Um, you know, she's working in the women's basketball office. I happened to need a lot of stuff for women's basketball. I kept showing up to her office. She happened to be there every time. Uh, started up a conversation and then um, dared her that she wouldn't go to New Orleans on a Monday night and have an adult beverage or two with me. And uh, somehow I won that bet and got lucky enough to get a wife out of it. Nice. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. All right. Um, hey, anybody in the audience, we got a couple minutes left. Anything you want to know uh, before we take a little break, before we start up uh, with Carwin? Just a heads up, you guys should definitely say for Carwin, I am like the opening act and Carwin is like the man. Like he's the one you want to see. Like you, you've seen the warm up band, Carwin. I mean, he's amazing. You guys are going to love him. When I was at College of Charleston, that guy taught me so much. It, it's unbelievable. So 
make sure you guys stick around for his for sure. That guy's a smart dude. We got a question from Spencer related to temper rolling, which I imagine is uh, some of that Dr. Thompson stuff, if people aren't sure. Uh, could be something different judging by your reaction, so I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> yeah. Did he have a specific question about it, or was it just tempering in general? Uh, I think it's why is it not mainstream yet? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you know what? Honestly, it's kind of expensive. Uh, I'm sure Spence remembers when we first got them, we only got – four or six of them and then we would put them down do hamstring specifically that's what the guys really love calves are absolutely brutal i don't have you done it yet joe i have so we have a question people aren't quite sure what it is um so oh, you want to so give them the quick yeah, little rolled, overview yeah i'm sorry it's a uh, it's rolled steel so the smallest ones are typically about yay big with a hole going down the middle um and then you are looking at probably somewhere between 70 to 175 pounds he has different names for them they're basically rolled steel and then you get them powder coated it's like a foam roller on steroids, um, and then you actually, as a partner, will roll your partner out, or you can roll yourself quads, anything you can get to. But it is absolutely so much better than foam rolling because you can't put your entire body weight on the foam roller, obviously, and get as much myofascial release. This stuff is absolutely amazing. Make sure after the webinar you go check it out and go look it up. Donnie Thompson's tempering is what you're going to find it under, and, and they're absolutely amazing. Torvin didn't stop being a little girl about it. You're going to be okay. <laughs> um. We got a question about diet and what kind of diet are you guys on? Obviously, um, you know, with the endurance-based stuff, ketogenic is big. And how um, do you know? So do you one, what kind of diet? Two, are guys using keto? And three, are guys on keto using you can? <laughs> that was a good third one. Um, so that's a great question. We definitely do have guys who do keto, and some of them are very successful at it. This goes back to are you going to change your lifestyle? Are you actually going to go through the entire process of doing it? Will you stick with it for multiple months? And then lastly, what is your deployment going to look like? So if you're going to a place that's going to have great food and you can eat high protein, high fat, and not have to worry about having you know processed carbs constantly, you can absolutely get away with that and probably be okay. Now, would I recommend it for your actual <clears throat> performance as a ranger? Probably not. What happens when you need to sprint up the hill? What happens when you need to carry something heavy? What happens when you need to be powerful at any given moment? I'm not saying you can't do it. There are ketogenic athletes out there who do it. However, I don't think overall it's the uh, diet that I would recommend for this population. Uh, a strictly endurance athlete absolutely can see some great results from it. And having you can on top of that with the superstar sort of slow digesting where it's here all the time instead of the spike and valley would be extremely important if you are going to be ketogenic and also still do power, strength, <clears throat> or rangering if you will. Cool. Cool, cool. And – this is just a personal question. So obviously you, uh, you know, are powerlifting strongman um, and with your background training, you know, all different populations, you know, so have you started to bring some more specific strongman powerlifting style things into training the guys? That's a great question. I think a lot of the carry stuff, and that was actually one of the first questions you would ask from the audience. I think some of those things are absolutely applicable, right? These guys carry kits, litters, uh, water. Uh, bodies, <clears throat> excuse me, Skedco's. So they have to carry a lot of things, and a lot of that carries over to some of the farmers carries, coning carries, basically anything where you're putting your body under load and walking with it. And like we talked about, that stabilization is so important and so underutilized in training, especially for core training. So I absolutely have worked in some of that. We have worked in a couple of the other events just so the guys have something fun and new and, and kind of sexy to play with, like a log mm -hmm. and a circus dumbbell, et cetera. But most of the time, the biggest thing that I would recommend them doing, obviously, is sticking with the basics, the push, the pull, the hinge, the squat and a carry. If they can do those five to six things every single day along with their core, I'm a happy man and they're doing their conditioning and pass all the standards at a very high level. So yes, we do do some of those things. We have running bands and chains for you know squats and presses and pulls, but it is not our main focus. And we try to really do a really good job of kind of bringing everything together and utilizing, you know, not just Olympic lifting, not just power lifting, not just strong man, but every single component too. And we will do some bodybuilding movements. So the guy wants to go do a hundred curls at the end of the day and he's done all the other components, by all means, go help yourself do some arm farm and some freaking weapon maintenance and have a good time. Yep. No, never hurts, never hurts to do a little extra set of bicep curls at the end. Absolutely. That's all I remember you doing in Gamble. So that might be why I said that. I don't know. You know, and it never really helped my arms. It just, you know, I just, unfortunately, I, I tried. It just never really helped, you know. Uh, I mean, I just got to get the tattoo on my arm like you, and then I can look bigger, yeah, you know. It just looks I, bigger. I, it's not actually anything. It is just the tattoo. There's no question about it. Um, I know, I'm no, trying sorry. with the beard, so. <laughs> but you're handsome. My mind's just the ugly man, dude. 
Um, so going back to the diet real quick, I want to address that. Well, I got a second before <clears throat> Carwin comes on and uh, blows everybody's minds. Um, we have a very wide variety of diets. Uh, we have guys who are high carb. We have guys who are high fat. And, and the biggest problem is the internet right now, to be honest with you. The guys go on there, they see a couple things, and instead of talking to the person who's paid to help them, the dietitian, and has their best interest in mind, they'll ask their buddy who's a bodybuilder, or ask their buddy who's a vegan, or they'll ask their buddy who does this. And all of a sudden, they get all this misinformation, you know, and that, um, what was that Netflix movie? Um, what the hell? That thing has been absolutely crazy. And there's nothing wrong with people who eat vegan. By all means, if that is your bag, by all means, stick with it. If it works for you, God bless. But <clears throat> if you don't think that's propaganda as you watch it, I, I would greatly argue that it's slanted and they did a really good job of editing it in certain parts where you're sitting there thinking to yourself, is that really what the American Heart Association said? Now, what I did like about it was they called people out on their crap. <clears throat> but sorry, I digress there. But my point being, the guys have a very wide range of diets. Our dietitians do an amazing job of making sure they get individualized accounts and make sure they get exactly what they need as far as macros, micros, and phytonutrients just to make sure they have everything they need as well as great supplements like you can. Cool. Awesome. Well, I think we're going to close it out. We haven't had any more questions from the crowd. I think I pretty much tapped everything I wanted to get out of you. Uh, any last comments or things you want to add? Man, I just want to say thank you, man. This is a great opportunity for me. Um, and I really appreciate talking to an old buddy and being able to uh, talk about something I love at the same time. <clears throat> That's living the dream right there. I can't complain about that. No, awesome. And thank you for doing it uh, for us. And same thing to me. This is just living the dream. I'm, you know, talking to you, talking training, talking stuff, helping people and, uh, you know, sharing how beneficial you can can be, uh, as well as just educating people about new things like the tactical space where, you know, a lot of our audience uh, may not have exposure to it. So it's just a cool way to help educate and spread the word and help people. Absolutely. So at this point, um, it is 827. Uh, we are going to have Carwin Sharp starting at 845 Eastern. Um, so I'm actually going to close this down for a few minutes. Uh, so stick around, obviously. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to kick you out or let you just hang in the room until I turn it back on, but we will be back. So if you got to run to the bathroom, if you need to get a quick drink, you need to have some you can so you have energy for the next half. Uh, it's going to be a little more dense. Carwin has a full presentation for us. Uh, it won't just be kind of a back and forth like me and Matt had. He will actually have more of a lecture format. So look forward to seeing you all in a few minutes. Matt, thank you. Part one in the books. Thanks, brother. Catch you later, buddy.